So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will have enough worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This is the word of the Lord. that um, there's another big O birthday coming up in the church um, and it's uh, Martin Garcia believe it or not and I think it's also got a five in it somewhere so in advance uh, where have we disappeared to Martin in advance we want to wish you a happy birthday uh, coming up in April no, sorry. Um, may the Lord bless you with many many Thank you, Jane. Let's sing a brief song. Thank you for all that you have done. we might enjoy fellowship with you, that we might have a relationship with you, that we might come to know you more deeply, intimately. And so we want to acknowledge this morning our thankfulness for our salvation. May we never take for granted what we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we plead with you in your grace and mercy, continue to shape us, continue to transform us more and more so that we would reflect the Savior who died for us. Help us to become examples of Jesus Christ in this world, a light in a dark world. For Jesus' sake. Amen. The International Youth Conference Trinium in Bloomington, Indiana, July 1980, so it's going back a while. Professor Bruce Riggins of McCormick Theological Seminary was sharing with 3,800 attendees that he had met a very dedicated Christian working in an amazing way with underprivileged people in London, in England. He wanted to know what inspired her to her Christian faith and action. 
She shared her story of how seeing another Christian's faith converted her. She was a Jew fleeing the German Gestapo in France during World War II. She knew she was close to being caught and she wanted to give up. She came to the home of a French Huguenot. She knew she was, uh, um, the Gestapo were not far behind. A widow lady came to that home to say that it was time to flee to a new place. The Jewish lady said, it's no use. They're going to find me anyway. They are so close behind. The Christian widow said, yes, they will find someone here, but it's time for you to go. Leave, please, and go with these people to safety. I will take your identification and wait here. The Jewish lady then understood the plan. The Gestapo would come and find this Christian widow and think that she was the fleeing Jew. As Professor Riggins listened to the story, this Christian lady of Jewish descent looked at him in the eye and said, and I quote, I asked her why she was doing that, and the widow responded, It's the least I can do. Christ has already done that and more for me. The widow was caught and imprisoned in the Jewish lady's place, allowing time for her to escape. Within six months, this Christian widow was dead in the concentration camp. The Jewish lady never forgot that. She too became a follower of Jesus Christ, lived her life serving others. She met God through the greatest love a person can give, personal sacrifice. In faith, an authentic Christian lives their life serving others, saying, this is the least I can do, considering what great sacrifices Christ has made for me. Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. You know, we read and hear stories like that when I read it, and I was moved by that story. I thought to myself immediately, I've never faced that intensity of pressure in my life. Where my life is on the line, and I may lose it if I follow my Christian path. And the reality is, and I've said this many times from this pulpit, living in Australia, the chances are very slim that we're going to encounter that kind of intensity of pressure. The pressures we face are different to that. They come in different forms, different guises. They, they may come in a situation where we feel pressured not to speak up because the kind of discussion that's being had goes against our faith. And if we speak up, people are going to look at us in strange ways or they're going to avoid us after that or talk behind our backs. Maybe it comes when we face a, a particular temptation and the temptation comes to us as very powerful and we, we know what the right thing to do is, but we find ourselves really in a compromising position. And what Jesus does with these disciples here, do you see, is he says, now that we've sorted out the worry part, you don't have to worry, I'm going to meet your needs. I'm going to ensure that Whatever else happens to you, you're not going to lack anything. So let's put the worry to one side. And he proposes something radical. So I want you to notice Jesus' radical proposition, verse 33, and it is. It's radical. But seek first his kingdom. In the light of removing this angst about if we seek God's kingdom, how's that going to work out for us? What's that going to look like? How's it going to affect our day-to-day -day living? Jesus says to them, 
put that to one side. Make sure that your focus remains on seeking me first and foremost. Now, implied in that, and it seems obvious, I'm going to say it anyway, even though you're going to sit here and say, we know this, this is obvious. So let me point out the obvious. You can't seek the kingdom of God unless you are part of that kingdom. Now, while in a sense that's an obvious thing to say, sometimes the danger is that people think that they're part of that kingdom but haven't truly entered into that kingdom through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And the only way to be part of God's kingdom is first to turn away from our sin, first to repent, first to come to the foot of the cross, and there to lay down our burden at the feet of Jesus, the burden of our sin, and there to confess Jesus Christ as Lord, there to receive the forgiveness of sin, there to enter into a relationship with God, to be reconciled to God through Christ, then we enter into the kingdom. Because only those who have truly been transformed through the renewing and the creation of a new person in them through the work of Jesus Christ, only they can seek the kingdom. Otherwise, it's just surface stuff. Otherwise, we just go through the motions of seeking the kingdom of God. Otherwise, it's, it's something that's separate from us, something external. And while we can play church, while we can pretend to go through the motions of being saved and being a Christian, unless there's been a true transformative work within, deep within our soul, we're just playing games. And so it's really important that we are confident that we are part of the kingdom. Now, in a, in a congregation like this, I'm sure most of you are part of that kingdom. But there may be someone here who has yet to become part of that kingdom. And you are going through the motions. And this morning, the Lord Jesus Christ confronts you again, as he has many times, and asks you to reconsider your salvation. Are you really saved? And if not, trust in Christ. Because if you're going to be kingdom seekers, we first need to be kingdom people. And that only happens through conversion. And so John 3 verses 3 to 7, 3, 3 to 7, Jesus says, let me read it. So I don't misquote. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless what? Unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he's old? Nicodemus asked. Good question. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit flesh gives birth to flesh but the spirit gives birth to spirit you should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again you can't see the kingdom and you can't be part of the kingdom and you can't embrace the values of the kingdom unless you are born again so we've got the obvious out of the way are you born again If the answer is a resounding yes, then Jesus says to you, well, first seek the kingdom of God. We're going to look at some generalities and then we'll bring it down to some specifics. First seek God's kingdom. To first seek God's kingdom, Jesus means that we are to seek the things that will cause people to become part of that kingdom. In other words, it is a call essentially to evangelism. So in a a sense, Martin, what you shared this morning almost dovetails with part of what we are doing this morning. Seeking God's kingdom is seeking to see that kingdom that Jesus Christ has inaugurated through his coming into this world, to see that kingdom grow in this world. And in order for that kingdom to grow in this world, it requires for people to become part of that kingdom. And in order for people to become part of that kingdom, they need to be converted. And if they are going to be converted to become part of the kingdom, then the only way that occurs is that you and I seek out those who are lost and seek 
to help them to understand what the gospel is so that they may become part of God's kingdom. Seek first the kingdom of God. And so it is, in a sense, incumbent upon us as God's people to ensure that we don't become so, would, so inward focused or inward looking that we fail to remember that there's a lost world out there. And the way that that lost world comes to faith in Jesus Christ is through individuals reaching out to the lost world. The, the danger we face, I think, sometimes as a church collectively, and I put myself in the same box here, is that we kind of almost want to rely on collective events to do the work that we should be doing at an individual level. It kind of takes the, the challenge of evangelism and it shifts it. It shifts the responsibility. And it says, well, you know, we as a church should be doing all these kinds of evangelism things. And, and that's not untrue. That's true. We should be engaged in reaching out in evangelism to our community. Please don't misunderstand me. It's not that as a church we simply just remove that responsibility from us altogether. But the most effective way that evangelism takes place, and you know this, is through personal one-on-one -on -one evangelism. Now, there are some in this church who just are naturally gifted in evangelism, who, who just ooze out evangelism wherever they go. Uh, and with, I don't want to embarrass anyone, but I was with someone on Thursday night who is like that. He is an evangelist by gifting. It's just the way that God has wired them. Others find it more difficult to engage in evangelism, and so it becomes a, a really hard thing for them to do. And so it requires for us, therefore, to ask that God, by His grace, would empower us by His Spirit to recognize the opportunities that He brings along, to take hold of those opportunities, and to seek to reach out to the lost in whichever way God has enabled us to do that. Now, there's no right or wrong way of doing that, in a sense. Well, there are some wrong ways. Um, I could mention a few, but I won't. Um, but you, what you've got to do, and, and, and this is, I know it's difficult at one level, is you've got to recognize how God has created you. You've got to recognize the gifts God has given you. You've got to recognize the strengths God has given you. And you've got to take those collectively, and you've got to figure out how best you can employ those in reaching out to the lost. Now, for some people, that may mean that every time they're with an unbeliever, they Bring the gospel into the conversation. Some people are very gifted at that. But I suspect most of us are not like that. I suspect most of us find it difficult to always do that. We're scared of offending, or we're scared of saying the wrong thing, or we're scared of coming across as some religious nut. So evangelism can be done in a variety of ways. It may be that it's, it's through a relationship that you develop with an unbeliever over time. And you spend time with that unbeliever. And bit by bit you begin to bring conversation, gospel conversations into that relationship. The, the difficulty here is that when we talk about that kind of evangelism, it's easy for us to say, well, you know, I'll just let my life speak and I won't actually say anything. But you need to say something. Because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So you can't just simply enter into a relationship with an unbeliever and hope that through your conduct and through the way you, you, you carry yourself that they may become saved. Well, they may become saved, but you probably are going to have to use words at some point. You're going to have to enter into a conversation. And hopefully if you've built up the trust of that person and, and spent enough time with them, you've won the right to enter into a conversation with them. Uh, for others, it may be uh, through your social interactions. Maybe it's through a school sporting event that your child is participating in. And as you mingle with those parents in the school who, who, uh, whose children are in the same team as your child, maybe it's in conversations with them that you open up opportunities. For those of you who are extrovert, maybe it's when you go to work on the bus and you're sitting next to someone and you are able to enter into a conversation or on a cruise. Now, cruises have opened up again, apparently. 
so you can get your cruise booked now and get ready to go. But maybe it's in that situation. Maybe it's joining the evangelism team and going out on the street and walking up to a stranger. Now, that, that's a very hard way of doing it, but some of you are gifted and, you, and you're able to do that. Maybe it's helping out a vulnerable person who's unsafe, taking a meal to them, ministering to their physical needs. That opens up opportunities for conversation. But the first step is prayer. The first step is to step back from thinking how you're going to do it and start praying that God would provide opportunities for you. And you heard Martin this morning, you'll be surprised at how many opportunities God will provide when you start praying about it. So can I encourage you? Start praying. Go and take that little card. Reach one. Think of that person you would like to be saved. Just that one person. Write their name down. Make it a daily priority to pray for their salvation. And pray over and above that, that God may give you more opportunities than just one person. Ask God to give you a sensitivity to the, the movement of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, my children know my voice. They're my sheep. They hear the voice of the shepherd. They know the voice of the shepherd. And that voice comes to us through the inner workings of the Holy Spirit. So that as, as the Holy Spirit begins to tap us in our heart or tap us in our mind to speak because He's providing an opportunity for us, if we are in touch with God, then hopefully we'll identify that, recognize it, and grab it with both hands. Which requires a, a sensitivity to God's Spirit within us. And that means being in daily contact with Jesus. In nurturing our relationship and growing in our walk with Him, we will come to recognize and hear His voice more clearly. And the other voices that call for our attention will begin to distinguish between God's voice and those voices that are not His voice. So seek his kingdom by seeking to reach out to unbelievers. You and I don't do it. No one will do it. Second, seek his righteousness. Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now what on earth does Jesus mean by that? Well, it's not a call to righteousness in the sense of imputed righteousness. In other words, when you and I come to faith, Jesus' righteousness becomes our righteousness. It is his righteous life that is credited to our account, which makes us perfect in God's sight. That's why you and I one day, as Christians, will be able to stand with confidence before God, because Jesus will stand up and say, I died for them, it's my perfect life in place of their imperfect life that saves them. He's not talking about that righteousness. He's talking about the righteousness that is our daily growing in holiness in our relationship with God. Remember what Peter writes when he writes to the churches, and he says in 1 Peter 1 verses 15 and 16, he writes and he says, Be holy as I am holy. In other words, living in a righteous way before God means that we live according to the standards of God and those standards that God imprints upon our hearts that He's revealed in His Word are lived out through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now the truth of the matter is, you can't do that unless you have God's Spirit in you. I mean, in a sense, that's obvious, isn't it? You know, as a Christian, all of you who are Christians here this morning, you know how hard it is when you try on your own strength to be good. You fail. We all fail at that. Unless someone here is perfect. 
And if you're perfect, John says, if we claim to be without sin, the truth of God does not live in us, and we are liars. And so the, the, the way in which you and I live out our faith is in dependence upon the power of the Holy Spirit who enables us through His strength to do what we cannot do based upon our natural abilities. It is to be fueled by the Spirit of God. That's why when Paul writes to the Ephesians in chapter 5, verse 18, he says, do not be drunk on wine which leads to debauchery, but instead be filled with the Spirit. It's so hard when you try and do things independently of God's strength. And so often when we do, we are met with failure after failure, frustration after frustration, and it's easy to become despondent, and it's easy to focus on our failures and to become disillusioned in our faith rather than to say to ourselves, Lord, yes, I, I, I've tried and, and I'm failing in these areas, but you strengthen me, you help me, you enable me to become more and more pure. And what that means effectively is that we allow the Holy Spirit who is in us to take control control of all parts of our lives. Oh, that's so much easier said than done, isn't it? It's handing over the keys of our, our every door in our lives, every room in our lives. It's handing over the keys to every room to the Lord Jesus Christ and saying, you come into that room, you unlock the door, you walk in, and you take control of that. It is a yielding to him. Now that I think you need to do, and I need to do daily. Because maybe you're different to me, I don't know. But what I know about myself is I need God's power in me every single day. And the days when I'm at my worst are the days where I'm not in contact with Jesus. Are the days where I miss my Bible reading. I mean, I've just had a really brief, superficial time in prayer. It is for us to come to Christ and to truly surrender. Remember that song, for those of you a little bit older you, who are my age, do you remember that song we used to have at evangelistic rallies? We don't have them anymore, churches. Or to Jesus I surrender, or to him I freely give. I surrender all, I surrender all, or to you, my precious Savior, I surrender all. Have you surrendered all to Jesus? Have you given over those keys to him so that he has access to every single room in your life? Are you and God fighting over something? Are you wrestling with God and saying, yes, Lord, you can have this and you can have this, but, but not this? John Stott, you all know who John Stott was, a British uh, minister, written a number of different books, no longer with us. I heard him preach in Brisbane way back in 2000, and it was about 2001. In his commentary, he writes, in his commentary on the Sermon on the Mount, he writes, in the end, just as there are only two kinds of piety, the self-centered, and the God-centered, so there are only two kinds of ambition. One can be ambitious either for oneself or for God. There is no third alternative. Living righteously means living according to God's ethics, according to God's morals, according to God's word. It means following ruthlessly what Christ has revealed to us. It means looking at the example of Jesus. 
and it means centering our lives on who Christ is so that Jesus Christ permeates every part of our being. Now, you know, as you get older, that becomes more difficult and easier. So those of you who are younger, bear with me here. The problem with becoming older is that you can't have been there and done that. And you've come, you've, come, you've come to live with failures over a long period of time. And you've come to know yourself reasonably well at that point. And so you know the things you've tried and you know the things that haven't worked and you know the things that have failed. And it's easy to think, well, I've been a Christian a long time. I've got all of this stuff in my head. I, I kind of know the ins and outs. And we can easily become comfortable, complacent, or, or just apathetic. Not because you want to become apathetic, just because you're so familiar with everything. The positive side of growing older is you know your strengths and weaknesses, don't you? You've come to know what to do when certain things happen. So that, you know, for me, for example, if... If I'm feeling a little bit sorry for myself, if I've become a little bit self-centered, I then turn to Job chapter 38 and I read those next three chapters. And I hear the questions that God poses to me. Were you there when I did? Can you? And I'm humbled again. And the focus goes off me onto, back onto God. When I'm down and out and I'm feeling difficult and, and, and life is on top of me and, and the pressures are great and the challenges are great, I often go to the Gospels where I'm encouraged when I look at Jesus. Or I go to the prophets and see the many challenges the prophets face. I go to someone like Moses who in Exodus chapter 14 says, Lord, I don't know what to do with these people. They want to stone me. Poor old Moses. Hard times. And so you learn what to do. Or when devotionally you're struggling and, and you're thinking, you know, my, my passion for Jesus is not what it used to be and, 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 and I'm just struggling devotionally. You, you know where to go. You know what kind of books in the Bible help you devotionally. You, you know what kinds of other books or reading that might help you devotionally. So, so there's help in that. When you're younger, you're still learning those things. But the point is that you never tire of seeking to live in a way that reflects God's holiness. We never allow ourselves to think, I don't need to be challenged anymore. We constantly bring our lives daily to the submission of Christ pleading and crying out to God to fill us with his spirit so that the power comes from him, not us. That as we are thrust out into this dark, dying world, that Christ oozes out of us. And wherever we go, and whatever encounters we have with people, when we walk away, we've left behind the fragrance of Christ. That means Jesus takes first priority. That means we don't lose our intensity that means we don't lose our passion. A girl at Sunday school was asked, is your father a Christian? Said the Sunday school teacher to the child. The little girl answered, yes. I believe that father is a Christian, but he has not worked at it much lately. We work at it by God's grace. This is not a kind of a relinquishing that steps back and says, I don't have to do anything, God will do it all. But this is one that works hand in hand with the work of the Spirit in us.
seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then what are we told? Well, look at verse 34. Or second part of chapter 3. And all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day is enough. Here is the secondly reassuring promise of Jesus. It's wonderful. He says, all the things that are so pro prone to cause us to become concerned and, and worried and, and thinking about if we focus our energy and we pour our energy into doing those kinds of things and Jesus is priority in our life and we, we gear towards seeking his priorities and we gear towards serving him and we gear towards seeking his kingdom, then what about these other things? And, and Jesus wants his disciples to say, stop worrying about it. Jesus will sort you out. Jesus will ensure you have enough. All these things will be added unto you. Therefore, stop worrying. Don't worry about tomorrow. And the words of Jesus are so pertinent today because he says this, you can't control tomorrow. You have no ability to control what's going to happen. You have no say about what's going to happen. What will happen will happen tomorrow. And tomorrow's got enough worries of itself, so don't get concerned about what may or may not happen tomorrow. Live in the present. That is not to say you should not plan for the future. Please don't misunderstand me. But in terms of thinking about uh, your, your life and the way it's being worked out in terms of the values of God's kingdom and the priorities of the kingdom of God, don't uh, think that because you are focused on those priorities that somehow you're going to lack in the other areas. God sometimes intervenes in, in, in incredible ways to provide for us when it seems as though we are faced with impossible situations. I've picked out two examples from Scripture. And then I want to quote what Queen Elizabeth I said to one of her. The first is Genesis 22, 1 to 19. We won't read it. But you remember the story of Abraham and, and taking his son Isaac to the altar to sacrifice him? Just think about that for a minute. His only son, born from Sarah, at such a late age, She's beyond childbearing, but God works a miracle anyway. So this promised son has finally arrived. And God says to him, Abraham, sacrifice him. Take him. And Abraham, Isaac must have known, even though Abraham didn't tell him, Isaac must have known there was something afoot. But takes him to this place, binds him on the altar. I, I can't even begin to imagine that. It's just too hard for me to process. And then with the knife raised, about to plunge it into his son, the promised son, God says, stop. Now I know. Now I know who you love most in your life. God provides a ram in the thicket. And says to Abraham, sacrifice him. 1 Kings 17, 8 to 16. Remember the story of the widow at Zarephath and how Elijah comes to this woman. There's famine in the land. She's got nothing. She's taking her, her, her making some uh, last meal so that her and her son can eat this last meal and then starve to death. And Elijah comes to her and, and he says to her, give me something to eat. And she says, what are you talking about, man? Don't you know? I haven't got anything. This is the, all I've got. And this is going to be for the last meal for my son and I. And you're telling me to give it to you. You must be nuts. But she does it. And, I, and Elijah says, the oil will not stop. And God amazingly provides for this woman. Can you imagine that? Having a jar of oil, every time you pour it out and you put it back, it's full again. You wouldn't have to go to Coles, Woolworths. It'd be great. Mind you, you need that with toilet paper, don't you, at this rate? 
But, you know, God provides. God provides. Psalm 37, 25, let me read. I was young and now I am old, yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging for bread. When we take care of God's business, God takes care of our business. Queen Elizabeth I asked a certain merchant of London to go abroad for her upon the affairs of state. He pleaded that his own business would suffer, whereupon she replied, Sir, if you will mind my business, I will mind your business. Do you get it? When we focus on God's business, God will sort out whatever we need to sustain us, to keep us going. And God does not go back on his promises. God does not revoke his promises. God does not somehow change his mind. God is not a man like you and I. That should change his mind or go back on his word. Every promise in Christ is yes and amen. And the amen is spoken, says Paul, as he writes to the Corinthian church. I want to tell you, you can't outgive God. You can't. So when you and I get our priorities right and we become God's man or God's woman before we are a husband or a wife or a father or a mother. When we seek God's will in our business, in our day-to-day -day affairs. When we seek God's priorities first. When we seek God's kingdom and prayer above our recreation. When God's desires become our desires. When the intensity and burning passions of God become our passions. And when we begin to work those passions out. And his kingdom takes priority. All these things will be added unto you. So let me ask you, and let me ask myself. What am I seeking above all else? What's the real passion of my soul? Amen. Now, Father, we thank you for your word that once again reminds us to get our values and priorities right. And when we do so, everything else falls into place. So help us in this endeavor, we pray. Strengthen us, for we are weak and frail. Thrust us out. May we be your people seeking your kingdom and your righteousness above all else. So that we don't allow worry to plague us and interrupt the process of seeking your kingdom. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's stand as we sing.